and the market. And you remember from the Radford reading that one of the interesting things was the claim very soon after capture, people realized it was both undesirable and unnecessary in view of the limited size and equality of supplies to give away or accept gifts of cigarettes or food. Goodwill developed into trading as a more equitable means of maximizing individual satisfaction. And in the video, I expressed surprise about that. How could trade be more equitable than gifts? And the answer is, this is a routine relationship, and if I expect a gift when I give you one, that's actually what exchange is. That's arguably the origin of exchange. In fact, that's exactly the chartalist view that Vigna and Casey talk about, where we keep track of debts, and over time, some kind of currency takes over our mental accounting of what is owed to us. Instead, we just exchange tokens that represent units of debt. It's interesting that they perceived that that kind of exchange was more equitable, and the reason is obvious when you think about it. It's the, the power of exchange is that in a voluntary exchange, both parties are better off. In a voluntary exchange, both parties are better off. That statement is so straightforwardly true that you probably miss its significance, because it's one of the most powerful arguments for some and against other systems of social organization. In a voluntary exchange, both parties are better off. Now, we're, we're rewarding a kind of subjectivism here. That is, we're allowing people to be their own judges of what makes them better off. It might be, and you've seen this if you live in New York, that the mayor and city council think that you are not better off buying a big-ass Coke. Wait, that Coke is too big. You're not better off. We're going to prevent it. You'll have to buy three small ones instead. But with that proviso, and you know, maybe they're right. Maybe they're right that people are not very good judges subjectively of what makes them better off. But this is a subjective claim which means that it is the people's beliefs that the exchange must have made each of them better off, or they wouldn't have participated in the exchange. So the core argument, or a core argument for markets, is that voluntary exchange makes both parties better off, which means that the more exchanges, the better. The more exchanges, the better, because each exchange makes both parties better off. And if you have one person who engages in millions of exchanges and they earn profits as a result, they have made more people better off than anyone else. And that would be the justification for saying that they're entitled to those profits. Now we've problematized that by saying that a lot of things that look like profits are also the result of rent seeking. And rent-seeking might either be enlisting the aid of the state to give you anti-competitive rules, or monopolistic trade practices, where we enter into contracts in restraint of trade. And remember, Adam Smith said, people of the same business seldom gather together, even for purposes of merriment, lest they conspire to raise prices and restrict output. Well, in both of those cases, the profits they're not entitled to. Those are actual harms. Question is, what is the preponderance of the source of profits? How are we to decide? The public policy implication then is that the state should take only minimal actions to regulate voluntary exchanges. And again, this raises the subjectivity problem. Suppose I honestly think that heroin makes me feel good. I'm probably right about that. At the moment that I inject heroin, it feels good. Am I better off by injecting heroin? Well, it's a good weight loss program. But mostly, no. 
Should the state protect me from the fact that I am not able to make good judgments? Well, there are a lot of activities where we're not talking about heroin, we're talking about something much simpler. In those cases, and I belabored this point quite a bit, in those cases where there's no problem with subjective assessments being incorrect, that is, we're going to allow people to decide, a voluntary exchange makes both parties better off. And in that case, the job of the state is straightforwardly simply to reduce transactions costs. Transactions costs are the costs of effecting an exchange. They might include trust, use of a currency, use of a court system in the case of breach of contract. The job of the state in intervening in markets then is to reduce transactions costs because reducing transactions cost increases the number of voluntary exchanges and increasing the number of voluntary exchanges enhances welfare more than anything else. Provided the state has done the other things that states do, provide police protection, national defense, perhaps a road infrastructure. So there may be some other activities for the state. But in the context of markets, the state's job is to reduce transactions costs. Raising the question, did this space alien act badly? Now, I put this up on the first day of class also, but let's review. The conceit of this, this cartoon is called Leo. Leo never speaks. Now, Leo is in outer space in his little rocket ship, and he lands on the moon. And then he, he realizes that he can't breathe because it's a vacuum. And there's an alien there selling spacesuits for $25. And the alien, because no one speaks in this comic strip, is holding a sign, and it's in quotes, so you can tell that it's an advertising slogan, because you can't hold your breath forever. I read it like it's an advertising. You see what I did there? Is the space alien acting badly? Well, notice poor Leo is trying to hold his breath. Even if he's pretty good at that, he's got maybe two or three minutes. Now, you might want to ask why, when he was in outer space, he was able to breathe. It's a cartoon, for God's sake. He needs air now. Is the space alien acting badly? Well, if he shot him down, yes. If he fired some sort of laser death ray and shot him down and then tries to sell him a space suit, that's bad. Is the alien acting badly? What is the alien actually doing? He's trying to provide something that Leo desperately needs. Leo really, really needs a space suit. The alien did not create the need for the space suit, but he is answering it. Should this transaction be outlawed? Let's suppose spacesuits cost a dollar. What price should the alien charge? Well, it's not a declared emergency, but still, it seems a little out of line to charge $25. Is the alien acting badly? Well, I think many people, to answer that question, would want to ask a different question. Is this a voluntary exchange? Is this a voluntary exchange? Well, the way that we define voluntary usually involves choices. What alternatives does Leo have? Probably doesn't have any. There's no competitive market here. There's only the one guy selling spacesuits. What would happen if we said, wait, that's a monopoly. We're going to outlaw that. Leo would die. He would die gasping, turning blue, flopping like a fish. 
he would have little sympathy with this public policy whose rationale is we have to protect you from high prices. We love you so much, Leo, that you should die. So it seems like there's a problem. Even if it's not voluntary, the conclusion that therefore the state should prevent it doesn't follow. We'd need to know more. So, a parable. Let's suppose that I have a gun. Mackenzie has a purse. I'm, you'd never carry that, I'm sorry, but let's suppose. I have a gun, Mackenzie has a purse. Now I have a gun and a purse. Because I said, I'm pointing the gun at you, either give me that purse or I will shoot you. And she thought, hmm, I like this purse and it's got stuff in it that's really valuable, but he's going to kill me. I'm going to give it to him because I'm better off giving it to him than not. And I'm better off because I get the purse. Was that a voluntary exchange? We're both better off. We're both better off. Is that a voluntary exchange? Well, you might say no, because it seems like theft, and we're not gonna allow theft, but you're leaping to conclusions. I said she had a purse, and I had a gun. What if she's a thief? She stole it. I'm a cop. I'm going to restore it to its rightful owner. You were making assumptions about property. You were making an assumption about the pre-existing distribution of wealth and power. Many objections to markets are actually objections to the pre-existing distribution of wealth and power. Many objections to markets are actually objections to the pre-existing distribution of wealth and power. So what is the, the link here that's missing? And the answer is property. How did we decide who owns what? Now we talked early in the semester about property, the origins of property. If that purse wasn't hers to begin with and she stole it, then in a sense she was being coerced voluntarily. If you live in a society that has property rights and you violate those property rights, you have agreed to be punished. If I violate the rules, I've committed an immoral act. I have violated the rules that reason and law tell me about respect for other people's property. So when I, the policeman with the gun, force her to return it, in a way, it is a voluntary exchange, but it's voluntary in the context of a larger set of institutions, chief among them, property. Well, let's look at an example of how that might work, why it's an important problem. What is a sweatshop? Sweatshop is a factory manufacturing facility that has pay, safety, and comfort conditions that are far below what we think is acceptable for workers. Sweatshops in the United States are illegal because we have minimum wage laws, safety laws, uh, working condition laws. There are many countries where sweatshops are not illegal. Suppose I conclude workers in sweatshops are being exploited. It's wrong. I'm going to walk in and save them. All right. I say when I go into the sweatshop, all of you are fired. Don't thank me. No, all of y'all can leave. And they say, the hell is wrong with you? This is the best job we can get. Why do you think closing the sweatshop helps us? I've had this discussion a number of times with Duke students 
who wanted to buy the sweatshirts, pants, underwear, all the stuff y'all have that has Duke on it. And they say, this is wrong. This was made in a sweatshop. We shouldn't buy from sweatshops. You really think that helps the people that work there by not buying from them? Do you really think it helps Leo to say the spaceman can't sell the spacesuit? You're objecting to the pre-existing distribution of wealth and power. You're saying those people shouldn't be so poor that the best job that they can get is in a sweatshop. I agree. That's right. I wish they were not so poor. I wish their governments had better institutions. Since they don't, the sweatshop is actually the best answer to the problem of the terrible distribution of wealth and power. That's the best job they can get. So the objection to inequality is a legitimate objection. But inequality is not an, an objection to the use of markets. Markets in those societies tend to mitigate inequality. If you look at China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, wages have risen dramatically as a result of sweatshops. Because over time, they've started to develop a middle class. Is it unfortunate that they're so poor? Yes, absolutely it is. But you're confusing cause and effect. Under some circumstances, allowing voluntary exchanges is the answer, not the problem. There are also circumstances, child labor, slavery, human trafficking, where markets induce really bad rent-seeking behavior and theft. So it'd be great if there was just a simple answer. All we need is markets, and that's not true. Markets and the greed they tend to embody in societies that lack formal institutions of property often result in theft and exploitation. Still, the answer is voluntary exchange. If we can get into a situation where people are allowed to engage in more and more voluntary exchanges, then we start to begin to get increased wages in a middle class. So exchange corrects mistakes. I said before that it is immoral for me to use something that someone else values more. It is immoral for me to use something that someone else values more. It would be a mistake. Well, if exchange is possible, I have price, which gives me the information that somebody values it more, and trade or exchange, which gives me the opportunity to take advantage of that information. Exchange corrects mistakes then, because it moves stuff towards higher valued uses. Exchange corrects mistakes in allocation. Exchange makes everyone who exchanges happier, in many cases a lot happier. We've talked before about the two basic origins of exchange, and both of those are important. Same stuff, different preferences. Same preferences, different stuff. But that's not the origin of markets. The origin of markets, and you should know this by now because we've talked about it so much that it's boring. Those two things are the origins of exchange. The origins of markets is division of labor. Division of labor and specialization. I went today to a retina surgeon, and retina surgeons probably don't work many places that have less than a million people. You have to have a lot of people for someone to be able to survive with a specialty that's advanced laser retinal surgery. And I thought, gosh, I'm really glad I live in a place where the extent of the market is large enough that that kind of specialization can be supported. So remember, this is how you should think of China in 1990. Many factories 
many, many people working at very low-wage jobs on individual sewing machines. And this is 2005. Just 15 years later, you have one-tenth as many workers producing 100 times as much stuff. What country in the world lost the most jobs between 1990 and 2005? China, by far. Because we moved from this to this. But these women make far more in salary than those. So wages go up with productivity, but you lose jobs. The question is, how do we create the jobs that moving from here to here goes? But exchange in and of itself makes people better off. So probably the origin and origin of division of labor, the origin of the notion of division of labor, is Xenophon. Xenophon, the Greek, wrote, in small towns, the same workman makes chairs, doors, plows, and tables, often the same artisan even builds houses. Whereas in large cities, many people have demands to make up, to, to make upon each branch of industry, and therefore one trade alone, and very often even less than a whole trade, is enough to support a man. That sentence ought to be taken out and shot. In large cities, we find one man making men's boots only and another woman's own, women's only. One man lives by cutting out gar garments, another by fitting together the pieces. This is 400 BC. This is written actually before that, about 450 BC. So Xenophon recognized the importance of division of labor for creating a setting in which we can exploit the benefits of exchange. So exchange, we're just moving stuff around. Division of labor creates stuff. Exchange, we're just moving existing stuff around. Division of labor creates stuff. That's what causes markets. Remember, markets are institutions for reducing the transactions cost of impersonal exchange. Markets are institutions for reducing the transactions cost of impersonal exchange. In order for markets to make sense, you need division of labor. Then you can get a concentration of population that's large enough that instead of one guy doing all the woodworking, you can specialize. So the question is, I've made this operatic harangue in favor of voluntary exchange. You're saying, maybe that's true, I'm not sure, maybe that's true, but it certainly depends on what voluntary means. And you probably, your first thought's gonna be, well, voluntary means uncoerced. Nobody forced me to do it. Is that enough? Is it voluntary if no body forced me to do it? That is, does it require human agency? Anything where the coercion is not by human agency is voluntary. I think most of us don't have that feeling, although economists do. Economists want to see many exchanges as voluntary. Philosophers and other social scientists tend to say, wait a minute. So let's think about that. And one of the readings for today is the Nicomachean Ethics from Aristotle. It's pretty difficult to get through, so I wanted to hit some of the highlights. And this is from book three. Aristotle writes a lot about virtue. And the punchline is that a virtue is a habit of right action. A virtue is a habit of right action. That habit is acquired by acting right over and over again. What is right? Right is the conclusions that I reach by applying reason about what is virtuous. So right actions are virtuous. By applying our reason to that, we can reach conclusions about what virtue is. 
then for me to be a virtuous person, I have to have a habit of acting that way. So a virtue is a property of a conclusion of reason, but it's also the way that, that people act. You can be a virtuous person. So a virtuous person acts in accordance with virtue. So it's a big circle. Virtue is concerned with passions and actions. And on voluntary passions and actions, praise and blame are bestowed. On those that are involuntary, pardon and also sometimes pity. To distinguish the voluntary and involuntary is presumably necessary for those who are studying the nature of virtue and useful also for legislators with a view to assigning both honors and punishments. That's an amazing sentence. Suppose that someone commits a crime, but for psychological reasons, they're literally incapable of acting any other way. Was it really their fault? Suppose they're insane. We might want to put them away so they can't harm other people, but are they actually culpable? Are they to blame if they didn't have a choice? If I have a talent that I have developed through effort, we tend to think that's praiseworthy. If someone is born with a leg that prevents them from running, we don't say they're lazy. We say that physical problem prevents them from running. It is not blameworthy. Those things are thought involuntary, which take place under compulsion or owing to ignorance. That is compulsory of which the moving principle is outside, being a principle in which nothing is contributed by the person who is acting or feeling the passion. As if he were to be carried somewhere by a wind or by men who had, them in their, had him in their power. So if I'm tied up and taken across state lines, I can't be arrested for having violated a law that says I can't cross state lines because I did it while I was tied up. It wasn't voluntary. With regard to things that are done from fear or greater evils, or for some noble object, if a tyrant were to order one to do something base, having one's parents and children in his power, and if one did the action, they were to be saved, but otherwise would be put to death, it may be debated whether such actions are involuntary or voluntary. So, someone has taken my wife and children hostage, and they say they're going to torture them to death unless I rob a bank and give him the money. Is robbing the bank a voluntary act? Well, I don't have to do it. I'm not literally forced to do it but I may be forced by circumstance. I'm forced by that coercion, by the threat of death to my wife and children. Does it matter that the person holding the hostages is a person? What if they're on a ship and there's a hurricane coming and there's something that I can do to save them? In philosophy, Many people take up what are called trolley problems. And the trolley problems are situations where people find themselves able to choose between two, between two different courses of action. So the usual way that it works is there's a train running down a track. And if it keeps going down the track, it's going to hit a school bus which has stalled on the train, on the track. But there's a switch and the switch is right in front of me. If I pull the switch, the train will go onto a different siding and it will kill an old man in a wheelchair. So there's 20 children on the school bus and if I do nothing, they will be hit. Or I can pull the switch and it'll kill the old man in a wheelchair, he's also stalled. What should I do? Well, sort of a standard utilitarian thing might say you should pull the switch, but you're killing the old man. You're not killing the children, the train is. 
Most of us have the sense that that makes a difference. I'm not killing the children, the train is. If I pull the switch, I'm killing the old man. Would that be an involuntary act or a voluntary act? Well, I'm, the circumstances that I'm in make, force me to make that choice. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. If I just do nothing and run away, the children died and I could have saved them. Something of the sort happens also to, with regard to the throwing of goods overboard in a storm. In the abstract, no one throws goods away voluntarily, but on condition of its securing the safety of himself and his crew, any sensible man does so. Such actions then are mixed, but are more like voluntary actions, for they are worthy of choice at the time when they are done, at the end of an action is relative to the occasion. Both the terms then, voluntary and involuntary, must be used with reference to the moment of action. Now the man acts voluntarily for the principle that moves the instrument, instrumental parts of the body on such actions is in him. And the things of which the moving principle is in the man himself are in his power to do or not do. Such actions therefore are voluntary, but in the abstract, perhaps involuntary. For no one would choose to do any such act in itself. I, there's a storm coming and we have a ship and there's a heavy cargo of gold. The ship is pretty low in the water. The storm is going to be bad. I say, there's a storm coming. We need to throw all the gold overboard, or most of it, because otherwise we're gonna sink. And the people, the, the, maybe you on the crew say, that's crazy. No one would voluntarily throw gold overboard. Well, am I acting involuntarily? And Aristotle's making an interesting distinction here. It's voluntary to the extent that I could do otherwise. It's voluntary to the extent that I could do otherwise. The choice is in me. The, the, the action is in me. But still, he says, the circumstances are such that in the abstract, it's involuntary. So I didn't really have a choice. So even though I make a decision and then act on it and it's in me, it's really involuntary. Well, suppose that you are the old man's relatives and I pulled the switch. Would you want me to be charged with murder? Trains coming, heading towards the school bus. I pull the switch, it kills the old man. Should I be charged with murder? Seems hard to conclude that I should not be charged with murder. Maybe my sentence should be reduced because of the mitigating circumstance, but I intentionally killed an old man. I took an action that I didn't have to take and I intentionally killed an old man. I felt really bad about it, but I did. The choice was in me, it was voluntary. Now, in my defense, I might argue, yeah, but it was involuntary given the larger set of circumstances. That's not how we usually judge things. It wasn't self-defense. This wasn't self-defense. I was making a choice between two courses of action. So, Aristotle defines voluntary, willing, and intended. So those things that are thought involuntary, which take place by force or owing to ignorance. Things are involuntary, which take place by force or owing to ignorance. The voluntary would seem to be that of which the moving principle is in the agent himself. He being aware of the particular circumstances of the action. And by the voluntary, I mean any of the things in a man's own power, which he does with knowledge. Suppose I didn't know that the man in the wheelchair was on the other track. That would be pretty different. If I say, oh look, there's a bus coming, it's gonna hit the, there's a train coming, it's gonna hit the school bus, and I pull the lever, and I didn't know the old man was on the track. That's pretty different. I may still have done something wrong, but it was negligence, it was not done with knowledge. For something to be voluntary, it must be done with knowledge.
Aristotle then is interested in compulsion. There's two kinds. Straightforward physical constraint, that is compulsory of which the moving principle is outside, being a principle in which nothing is contributed by the person who acts. So if you're carried by the wind or kidnapped, those are compulsory in a kind of abstract sense. And then there's also duress in mixed actions. The man acts voluntarily for the principle that moves the instrumental parts of the body in such, such actions is in him. And the things of which the moving principle is in a man himself are in his power to do or not to do. Such actions, therefore, are voluntary, but in the abstract, perhaps involuntary. He also talks about impulse. And an impulsive action might seem like it's just something you do quickly without thinking. But remember that virtue is a habit of right action. Virtue is a habit of right action. So for a virtuous person, you have virtuous impulses. A virtuous person has virtuous impulses. A person who is not virtuous has vicious impulses, that is, impulses that are consistent with vice. The word vicious comes from vice. Vicious means I'm acting in accordance with vice, not virtue. So habit has to be harnessed for virtue. Virtue is a habit of right action where the habit is cultivated as a result of a conscious decision to reason about what is right and then to act in accordance with reason. I also asked you to read the John Locke reading Venditio. Now, Venditio was apparently written in 1657. It was found in a, a folio in 1691, 1692. Um, a friend of mine had suggested this. It was largely forgotten. A few Locke scholars knew it, but I think it's an interesting thing to read because of its examples about economics. Venditio means a sale in Latin. And there's four examples. Price over time, the price of a horse, the price of wheat on board a ship, and the price of an anchor on the high seas. It's only four pages long, it's pretty short. And so this is actually a kind of minor fame for an economist. If you remind philosophers about a writing by John Locke that they don't know, that means that if you Google Venditio, you will mostly find my name. It's pathetic that I'm proud of that, but there you are. We all have to have some little thing. The question that Locke asks is, what is the just price? And then, when is the market price just? What is the just price? And then when is the market price just? Let me give a simpler example first. He says that there is a ship owner in Danzig, northern Germany, western Poland. He has two shiploads of corn. And in 17th century England, corn means wheat. Corn just means small grains of, uh, well, grain. I can send the ship to Ostend or to Dunkirk. At Dunkirk, the price is five shillings a bushel. But at Ostend, in Belgium, there is almost a famine. The want of grain means that many people need grain. The price is 20 shillings a bushel. Where should I send my ships and what price should I charge? One place, five shillings a bushel. The other place, 20 shillings a bushel because they really need grain. Where should I send my ships and what price should I charge? What would be just? Well, it would be odd, although I've heard people make arguments like this. You know, the people at Ostend, 
They really need the grain. It would be wrong of you to exploit them. Seriously? They really need it. It would be wrong of you to send it there. Surely, the right thing to do is to send it to the place that needs it more. That's what the high price is telling you. The high price is telling you that one place needs it much, much more than the other. So the real question is, what price am I allowed to charge? And I don't mean legally, I mean morally. Morally, what price am I allowed to charge? Well, Locke's answer is, the market price, if it exists, is always just. The market price, if it exists, is always just. But, and this is amazingly modern for 1651, market price requires there's many buyers and many sellers. There actually have to be many buyers and many sellers. If you're the only seller, you have to do something else. But in this case, there's almost a famine. But still, there are ships coming in and selling the grain for 20 shillings a bushel. So, what price can I charge? And Locke says, if you were to charge less, suppose you were to say, I could only get five if I send, if I send it to Dunkirk. It's wrong for me to charge more because these people desperately need it. I'm gonna charge them five. Well, the first guy on the dock says, wait a minute, you're gonna sell it for five? I will buy all of it. And then he immediately resells it for 20. If there's a secondary market, if there's actually a thick market in this commodity, you are not allowed to charge more than the market price, but you couldn't anyway because there's a market. The market disciplines you. And you're not obliged to sell it for less because if you did, somebody would just buy it and then resell it. You wouldn't be benefiting the people. So the market price is always just if the market price exists. But Locke is very careful, and I'm just gonna summarize. Locke is very careful to say, you must not use your market power to exploit the desperate need of another person. So if there's a market price, okay. But if you're the only seller, you can't use the desperate need of the other person to your benefit. So it's not true that whatever the market will bear is a just price. But the market price, if there are many buyers and many sellers, is a just price, according to Locke. That may be right or wrong. The question is, what did Locke think? And his question was, what is a just price? When is the market price just? The answer is, the market price is always just if there's many buyers, many sellers, and competition. And then he gives four examples about that. Well, the argument that I want to make is about a word that I made up. Because I was worried that economists don't understand the problem of voluntariness in the same way that perhaps Aristotle and certainly many modern philosophers do. And probably the way that individuals, voters, citizens think. So I took the Latin root voluntaris and added a Greek prefix, eu, meaning well or truly. And it's pronounced euvoluntary. Now, a euvoluntary exchange is one that's truly voluntary. A euvoluntary exchange is truly voluntary. The question is, what conditions are required to be truly voluntary? Conventional ownership. We both understand what ownership means. Conventional capacity to transfer. We both understand what it means to buy or sell. The absence of post-exchange regret for both parties in the sense that both receive value at least as great as was anticipated. Now, the non-regret condition has two meanings. One is no fraud. No fraud. That is, if I sell you a car and it has no engine, that wasn't really a car. You say, hey, that wasn't really a car. Just like that. Well, you would regret buying something that turns out not to be what I represented it to be. However, non-regret also has, it has to satisfy the problem of second order preferences. 
It has to solve the problem of second order preferences. So the question is not, do I want this? The question is, do I want to want this? So I lost 40 pounds. My problem is I really like donuts. I really, really like donuts. And if I go get a box of donuts, a dozen of them, I sometimes eat them. I don't mean the donuts, I mean the dozen. Dozen donuts is bad for dieting. I want donuts. I do not want to want donuts. There is an involuntary aspect to my intense desire for donuts. Now, I could say the same thing, except much worse, about heroin or crystal meth or cigarettes. Many people want cigarettes, but they don't want to want cigarettes. If I eat a dozen donuts, I regret it, even though in some sense I wanted it. So the non-regret condition means it has to satisfy first and second order preferences. Not only do I want it, but I want to want it. And no fraud. Fourth, no uncompensated externalities. Externalities are an effect on someone else who wasn't party to the transaction. And we'll talk more about that in market failures. Fifth, neither party's coerced in the sense of being forced to exchange by threat. That's the usual definition for economists. I want to add a sixth. Those first five make something voluntary. To be you voluntary, you have to add a sixth. Neither party is coerced in the alternative sense of being harmed by failure to exchange. I am not harmed by failure to exchange. So in the political world, power is measured by the capacity of one person or group to impose his will. In the economic world, we tend to think of power as being disparity. And it is particularly the disparity in BATNAs. BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. What happens if we don't exchange? It's not a bantha. See, you'll remember that. I don't know what the hell he was talking about, but he had a bantha up. That was pretty cool. So imagine Jane and Bill are considering exchange of a product for a sum of money. Jane has power over Bill if Bill suffers more from a failure to exchange than Jane does. If the consequences of failing to consummate the transaction are wildly different, then the exchange is not you voluntary. So, the Leo example. What happens to Leo if he doesn't buy the spacesuit? He will die. Is the exchange you voluntary? No. The exchange is not you voluntary because the disparity in outcomes from failing to exchange is too large. Don't have time to go through this because I want to do a quick example, but make sure you read this passage from Michael Sandel. It's worth studying. So here's a case. Suppose I go to the grocery store to buy water and the price is $1,000 per, per liter. How do I react? Do I say, this is outrageous. I need water. Without water, I will die. You can't charge me that. No, I look at the price and I go, ha, 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 ha. That's ridiculous. I'm not buying that. I can go somewhere else. I can go to Kroger and get it for a dollar. I can go to Whole Foods and get it for three dollars. I could even buy it at Duke and get it for like five or six dollars. So way less than a thousand. Like at the student stores, they only rip me off so much. So water is a necessity, but the exchange is you voluntary. It's not poisoned. If I were to buy it, it's okay. I have other alternatives. But suppose instead I'm far out in the desert. I'm dying of thirst. Now I'm rich, I have a lot of cash in my pocket, but I can't drink that. And I hear a rumble. And over the horizon comes a four-wheel drive ta taco truck. I think, thank the Lord, I'm saved. Here comes the taco truck. He pulls up and there's two specials. 
One special is three tacos for $5. Drinks, 1,000. Three drinks for only 2,500. That's a saving of $500 if you take the deal. What do I say? Well, maybe it's machete. Let's say it's, it's machete. Que te gustaría, gringo? So I'm a little bit scared, and he's got this deal. So I say, dude, I'm dying of thirst here. And he says, well, I, so I, I, I say, have a heart. What, I, I was hoping you would have a heart and not treat me this way. And so he says, well, I really hope you have dollars because I don't have a heart. He asks if I have enough money to pay his price. I admit that I do. But that just seems wrong because I'll die if he doesn't sell me the water. He says, all right, up to you. Have a nice day. I stop him and I get the special. I pay him $2,500 for three bottles of water. Was that exchange you voluntary? Of course not. The alternative was I was going to die. That's not a you voluntary exchange. Did he act badly? Well, according to Locke, I would have to know if he changed the price on trying to de after determining how thirsty I was. If he was just selling water at $2,500 for three bottles and he was driving around in the desert instead of going over by a construction site, which is where taco trucks usually are, he wasn't acting badly if that's the market price. It seems like there's something wrong with that. But what's interesting is that Locke's intuition is pretty close to many people's intuition about price gouging. Price gouging is when I raise the price because people are desperate. Locke would say that's wrong. In this case, if the price was high before because that's how much it costs to drive around in the desert hoping you find someone who needs water, then okay. So this is not a you voluntary exchange. It's not clear that outlawing it would help anyone. The objection is to the pre-existing distribution of wealth and power. It's a problem that I'm in the desert with no water. Access to markets is the solution, not the problem. Access to someone selling water is my salvation. It's not exploitation. I'll see you on Wednesday.